Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wild Oyster Survey Training for 2023. My name is Anna Weiss, and I'm the Community Science Program Manager here at Billion Oyster Project. And I'm so excited that you all are here to learn about wild oyster surveys and to get trained to become part of our Wild Oyster Watch or our WOW team. So a quick breakdown of what we're going to be doing here. Uh, first, you're in the video training portion of your wild oyster survey training. Um, you'll watch through this video and then complete a brief survey at the end. After that, you're going to do some field monitoring and pick up your materials. Um, so be sure you show up to your field monitoring site at least 15 minutes ahead of time. Uh, check your email if you have questions about when you're supposed to go to the field. And then once you've been trained in the field, you'll be ready to go and search for wild oysters. So you'll be all set to go look for wild oysters along your shorelines and to send data back to us. So to break down what we'll do in this video training portion, um, we'll go through some introductions. We'll talk about the Billion Oyster Project and why we're so excited about oysters. Then we'll talk about wild oyster surveys, why they're important, how to conduct them. We'll talk about the data and why it's so important to collect good data. And we'll talk about how we can avoid some of the most common data mistakes. We'll discuss some basic field safety, and then we'll talk about the logistics for part two, where you're going to get into the field and look for wild oysters. So first, an introduction to the Billion Oyster Project. We're an ecosystem restoration and public education project aimed at restoring sustainable oyster populations and igniting passion and appreciation for New York Harbor. We do this by engaging New Yorkers directly in the work of restoring 1 billion oysters to the estuary by 2035. So that's 1 billion oysters by engaging 1 million people. Um, we are founded on the belief that restoration without education is not going to last. And so we need your help to make sure that we restore ecosystems in New York's harbor. And we've been successful so far. We've restored more than 100 million oysters across 12 acres. We've engaged more than 8,000 local students and diverted 2 million pounds of shell from landfills. Welcome to the virtual tour. So to show everybody a little bit more about the Billion Oyster Project and what we do, I want to put everyone on a virtual tour of the Billion Oyster Project. Um, so you can go ahead and watch this video to see what we do and where we do it. Tour of the Billion Oyster Project. Welcome to the virtual tour of the Billion Oyster Project. We will be covering a few of our sites, such as Governor's Island, Red Hook Terminals, Brooklyn Navy Yard Wallabout Basin, and our Williamsburg Field Station. The Billion Oyster Project headquarters is located on Governor's Island. We have to take a ferry to get to the island every day. We have a few facilities located on the island, represented on this map by shells. Building 107, our Development and Communications Office, our Office and Aquaculture Lab at the Mass Center, Exhibit House, and Shell Pile. We'll start by having a look at the office in Aquaculture Lab. This is our office. It's located right on the waterfront. The office is also co-located in the New York Harbor School building. In this building, students learn professional diving, vessel operations, marine systems tech, and aquaculture. This is the Aquaculture Lab, where our oysters journey begins. When we spawn our oysters on our own, we must collect adult oysters for reproduction. These oysters can be collected from our reef sites around New York Harbor, such as Bush Terminal Park, Paddocket Basin, Jamaica Bay, Head of Bay, etc. However, sometimes due to the scale of the projects, we must purchase larvae from oyster farms. They will arrive as shown here in this video. Whether we're purchasing larvae or spawning them on our own, they are always eastern oysters. After cleaning the oysters, they are placed in these conditioning tanks. As the name implies, we condition the adult oysters for reproduction. Oysters can reach sexual maturity at about two or three years old. This is also when the male oyster can change genders to become a female. These tanks allow us to manipulate the water temperature so it mimics the slow increase of water temp towards the summer when they reproduce. We must also feed the oysters plenty of algae. In the hatchery, aquaculture students grow five types of algae that are nutritionally beneficial to the oysters. Growing algae is very tricky and crashes often, 
Therefore, all the equipment, these large cylinders included, must be bleached and cleaned before inoculation. Algae starts in test tubes, then is moved to Erlenmeyer flask. From there, the flasks are moved to carboys. Notice the airlines that are providing oxygen to all the algae. We also have an industrial plankton machine. This grows algae on an industrial level and creates a paste. This paste is then mixed with water to feed all the oysters. After the oysters are conditioned, well-fed, and the water temperature is warm enough, they will be moved to a spawning tray. It is a very shallow tray and the water is warm and stagnant to stimulate spawning so the oyster egg and sperm can meet in the water column above the oysters. Oyster sperm looks like a jet, whereas oyster eggs are emitted as a cloud. Here, you can see some oyster eggs under a microscope. In nature, the water currents can make it very difficult for the egg and sperm to find each other and eventually make larvae. The larva is the only swimming stage of an oyster's life. They have one small foot that allows them to swim and seek shell substrate. They can settle on anything hard but prefer calcium carbonate. Next, the larva is placed into these large conicals. The shape prevents the larva from sticking to the walls. They will stay in these conicals for about two or three weeks. The harbor water is pulled directly from the harbor and filtered before being used in the tanks. These three black filters have filter socks with different micron levels to capture any toxins, bacteria, or anything that shouldn't be in the water. After the water is filtered, it is held in these head tanks to use in the lab. Next, we prepare these big blue tanks. They are filled with bags of blank oyster shell. Each tank can hold up to 200 bags of blank oyster shell. Next, we're gonna take a look at our shell pile. Our shell pile is located south of our office. These shells at our shell pile come from partnering restaurants. After restaurant goers eat their oysters, they're collected and brought over. These shells stay at our shell pile for a year prior to use. The sun, rain, and snow remove any bacteria or diseases that might be present on our oyster shells. The shells are then put into bags by volunteers. We have been trying to shift away from plastic bags towards coconut bags or cellulose fiber bags. Next, we prepare the oyster larva. We'll remove them from the conicals and we'll have them ready to go. Hello, hello, hello. 7.6 mil. Ew. No big deal. There are millions of oysters in this photo. We release the larva onto the shells. The larva will swim around in the water until it settles onto a shell. At first, we see hundreds of oysters spat or larva that is attached to a shell. Later, we see 10 to 20 oysters growing on each shell. When they are about the size of a chili flake, we conduct spat counts, where we count how many oysters have attached to each shell. When they grow too large for the aquaculture lab to supply enough algae for the growing spat, we'll move them into remote set tanks. Next, you'll see one type of remote set tank we use here on Governor's Island. These tanks are filled with water directly from the harbor. This is to condition the baby oysters or spat. The direct harbor water also allows us to stop feeding the oysters the aquaculture grown algae. They still have air pumped to keep the dissolved oxygen levels high. The tanks are often covered in styrofoam to keep the water warm. Across the buttermilk channel in Red Hook, Brooklyn, we have a different type of remote set tank. At this location, we skip the bag shell stage and place the blank shell from the shell pile directly into a structure that they will be deployed in. These structures include gabions, oyster files, and a few others. Our hatchery tech, Ben, will explain more details about this site. This is what the top of the tanks look like. Because it's empty, you can see the structures in the tank. So these are all files for community reefs stacked on top of gabions down here. After some time in the remote set tanks, the oysters are moved to our eco dock or our other nurseries. Underneath all the grates, we house thousands of oysters 
which we use for different installations. Each tray is filled with bags of live oyster spat. Then they are stacked and hung. Older oysters will be moved to our Brooklyn Navy Yard Wallabout Basin floating nursery. Here, you can see some vessel operations and aquaculture students installing the stacks. We have a few nurseries around the harbor. One is located at SUNY Maritime in the Bronx, originally installed in 2019. Another one is located at 115 Marina in Brooklyn Bridge Park. These structures are called SEPA cages, installed in 2020. And lastly, one of our oldest nurseries is at Richmond County Yacht Club on Staten Island in Great Kills Harbor, installed as early as 2016. We have many, many stacks. For this reason, we often need volunteer help. They help by culling through the oysters to see how well the oysters are growing and see what kind of critters we find at each of these sites. Later, our oysters will be deployed in our harbor in different structures. We have bag shell reefs like this one at Lemon Creek Lagoon, Staten Island. Oyster research stations, which are adopted and monitored by schools, community groups, and community scientists. Those oysters. Can I take your picture? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gabions, which are two foot by two foot structures filled with blank oyster shell deployed in 2018 by the Tappan Sea Bridge. Larger gabions, like the one you saw at Red Hook earlier, these went into Soundview in the Bronx. Larger gabions such as these can also be found at Brooklyn Bridge Park. For example, these were installed in 2021, as well as at Gansaport Peninsula on the west side of Manhattan. Also at Gansaport, you could find another structure called a reef ball. These are made of eco-concrete. Eco-concrete is offset by larger aggregate or large rocks, thus using less concrete. This helps make the surface area more suitable for oysters by increasing surface area and also reduces the carbon footprint of the material. You can see that the reef balls installed in just June 2022 are already thriving in their new home. Next, we have community reefs. Community reefs are oyster reefs that are designed with the community monitoring in mind. During low tide, structures are pulled from the water and brought to the shore during programming. These include various structures such as community gabion reefs, community bagshell reefs, and community cabinet. The community cabinets and gabions, as shown here, have removable files that allow us to bring the oysters to the shore for monitoring with community groups, stewards, and school groups. Eventually, the oyster spat we install grow into these beautiful structures and reefs. We monitor the oysters and we'll always try to invite the community to join us. Next, we'll visit our Williamsburg Field Station. This new water quality lab along the Domino Park waterfront, which opened in 2020, is a site where Billion Oyster Projects hosts educational programming, professional learning events, and run a water quality lab where volunteers drop off their samples from around New York Harbor. Using an EPA approved testing method called IDEX Entero Alert, we are able to identify the amount of Enterococcus bacteria in each sample. Enterococcus is most widely used as fecal indicator bacteria. New York City has something called a combined sewer system, 
This means during dry weather, sewage from residents and commercial buildings will be sent to a sewage treatment center before being treated and released back into the harbor, as indicated in the graphic here. However, on a day when it rains as little as one-tenth of an inch or more, the rain can trigger a combined sewer overflow. This means that instead of going to a sewage treatment center, the sewage water from the buildings, such as your shower, dishwasher, laundry, toilet, etc., will be combined with the rain in the sewer drains and expelled directly into New York Harbor untreated. Seen here at the mouth of Newtown Creek in September 2021 is evidence of a CSO after Hurricane Ida. During a CSO event, the rain will wash the trash, oil, and other residues found on the streets through the drains directly into the harbor. An estimated 27 billion gallons of combined sewer and storm water are discharged into New York Harbor every year on the side of New York. New Jersey contributes a similar amount. There are about 500 outflows such as these scattered around New York Harbor and can be found wherever you see one of these little green signs. Harbor water samples are collected every Thursday morning during the recreational boating season from May to October. We and eight other partnering programs sample the water at more than 70 sites around the harbor most of them access points for boaters and fishermen. At the lab in our field station on Kent Avenue in Williamsburg, we process 25 to 30 samples a week. Staff and volunteers collect 10 milliliter samples of water from the sites around New York Harbor and deliver them to the labs. The labs will process the samples using a reagent and incubate them for 24 hours. Per the New York City Department of Health, if counts found at a city bathing beach are higher than 34 colonies per 100 milliliters, they could warrant a swim advisory, shown here in our results in yellow. Anything over 104 could warrant a beach closure, shown here in red. Results are published on our website on Fridays. You're always welcome to come and visit the field station on Thursdays and Fridays. We hope you enjoyed this virtual tour of the Billion Oyster Project facilities. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to check out the Billion Oyster Project's website for more information. Now that we've gotten to see a little bit about the Billion Oyster Project, let's learn a little bit about why we care so much about oysters. Oysters are important for three big reasons. They can clear pollution out of the water, they can increase biodiversity, and they can protect the shoreline from wave action. So oysters are filter feeders, which means they filter the water as they eat and can help remove pollutants. An adult oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day, and so the more live oysters you have in a body of water, the cleaner it should be. Oysters also help to create large physical structures off the sea floor, which help to protect us against things like storm surge and flooding. And so they help to protect the shoreline from floods and erosion. And then finally, because they're creating physical habitat off the sea floor, there's lots and lots of room for things like fish, invertebrates, and lots of other fun things to live on these oyster reefs, creating lots and lots of biodiversity in the harbor. Oysters are also important because they provide an opportunity for us to bring people to the shoreline and to interact with the harbor. And so oysters in this way offer a social solution to climate change. The Billion Oyster Project provides hands-on opportunities for the local community to acknowledge the realities of climate change, but also work to actively adapt through our oyster installations. So let's learn a little bit about oyster anatomy. So oysters have two valves, they're what we call vi bivalves. They have a left valve and a right valve. And when the spats settle onto the shell, they'll settle with the left valve downwards. We call the top part of the oyster the bill, this is the curved part. And then the pointy end is what we call the umbo. And when we're measuring oysters, which we'll do when we do our wild oyster surveys, you wanna measure the longest part of the oyster, which is generally going to be from the bill to the umbo. So we've learned a little bit about oysters. Now let's talk about why we wanna do wild oyster surveys. 
Wild oysters are different from restored oysters or the oysters that the Billion Oyster Project and others put into the water through our restoration. The wild oysters settle on their own as opposed to restored oysters, which Billion Oyster Project has placed there. When we find wild oysters, we think the conditions are good for placing restored oysters nearby. And that's part of why this collection of this data is so valuable to us. It's also possible that the wild oysters could be the offspring of restored oysters. And if that's true, that means our restoration projects have been very successful. So we can do these wild oyster surveys together along the waterfronts of New York City to learn about where wild oysters can live. The types of data that we'll be collecting during our surveys are going to be the presence of wild oysters, whether they're alive or dead. We'll take some other information about the site, such as the transect size and how many people are looking for the oysters. And then an optional set of data that you can collect is the height of the oysters, um, how big they are. So we've talked about wild oyster surveys. Let's talk about how we can spot a wild oyster in the field. So the best way to find a wild oyster is really just to get on your knees and your hands and to look closely because they're going to grow on surfaces and they're not always going to grow on the top of surfaces like this one here. They might be growing on the sides or on the bottoms. Wild oysters can grow in this kind of wonky shape. You can see all of these have a slightly different shape to them, um, but they are generally elongated. Again, you can see the bill and the umbo on almost all of these. And here's just some more examples of what you might see when you're looking for wild oysters. So here's a bunch that are growing on a rock. Here's one that's growing on a rock that you can see through the water. So this one is what we call subtitle or under the water. Here's some more examples of wild oysters growing on bulkhead and growing on wooden docks. And you can see again, the bill and the umbo on these as they're growing. And again, just more examples. The more examples you see, the better. And you're gonna get to see lots of examples in the field. Um, but there are other things that might look like a wild oyster. So for example, a barnacle, when barnacles grow and they fall off, they leave a mark that can uh, leave a scar on the shell that can look like a wild oyster. But one way to tell the difference between a barnacle artifact and a wild oyster is that the barnacle artifact will usually have a central circle with lines radiating out from the center. And you can see that really well in this picture here. So that's one way to tell the difference between a barnacle artifact and a wild oyster. Jingle shells are another thing that can look a lot like a wild oyster. Um, you can see pictures here. They tend to be a lot shinier and a lot more colorful. Slipper snails can also look a little bit like a wild oyster, um, but they do have this very clear slipper shape to them. They're also much more convex or arched than a wild oyster shell is going to be, which is going to be much more flat. So let's play a quick game of wild oyster or something else to see if we can spot a wild oyster in the field. So this first one right in the center, is this a wild oyster or is this something else? And so this is a wild oyster. So if you said wild oyster, that is right. What about these little things on the side and these things down here? Those are barnacles. So that is something else. All right, what about this? What is this a picture of? Is this a wild oyster or is this something else? And if you said something else, that is correct because this is not a wild oyster. This is a jingle shell. What about this? Is this a wild oyster or something else? And this is something else. This is going to be a slipper shell. What about these two? So we've got these sort of brown looking lumps and these are wild oysters. And so again, just be aware that when you're looking for wild oysters, they can be hidden sometimes by mud, sometimes by seaweed, they might be under something. Uh, so be sure to be looking very, very carefully and keep your eyes peeled. 
So if we look closely at this structure, there's a lot happening on it. But if we zoom into it, do we see any wild oysters on it? They see a bunch of different something else. They see worm tubes. We see slipper shells. Um, we see kelp and seaweed, or not kelp, we see seaweed growing on it. Um, but I don't see any wild oysters on this. So this is covered in other things, but no wild oysters. All right, so everyone is now an expert in spotting a wild oyster. Let's talk about how we're going to conduct the wild oyster survey. So what supplies are you going to need? You'll need your basic field supplies. So depending on where you go, you might need waders or boots. You should bring a first aid kit with you. And then depending on your COVID considerations, things like face masks. We do recommend hand sanitizers no matter what, because when you're in the water, you can get muddy and dirty and it's good to have hand sanitizer for that. The things that you're going to need specifically for your wild oyster survey are a camera and a camera phone is fine. You'll need a watch or your phone to check the time. You'll need a quarter or we'll give out magnifying rulers that you can use for size comparison on pictures and also for measuring the oysters if you like. You'll need something to measure how big your survey is. So whether that's a transect tape, a rope or string, or knowing your paces. And we'll talk about all those different methods in the video and in your training in the field. You'll also need a GPS. Your phone GPS is fine. You'll need some site maps, which you can, again, use your smartphone and just sketch them out in the field. Um, you can also, if it's windy out, might want to bring stakes or some other way to mark the land in case your transect tape blows away. Um, and then if you want and you are you know how to use calipers, you're welcome to bring them in the field if you use them, for example, for your ORS. Um, but if not, you're going to have a magnifying ruler and that's going to be more than fine. So how do we actually conduct the wild oyster survey? We're going to watch a short video to see how we do this in the field and then we're going to have a chance to practice during your field day. Wild oyster surveys are conducted by laying transects parallel to the shoreline. A transect is a straight line across the surface along which observations are made or measurements are taken. In this case, we are going to observe wild oysters along our transect. You can use a couple different things for your transect. You can use a transect tape, which is a special type of measuring tape that can be bought at Home Depot or any other home improvement store. You can also use traditional measuring tapes that you might use to measure your couch or another piece of furniture. Another option is to use a known length of rope. For example, cut a piece of rope or string to be 10 meters long. Stakes or rocks can be used to anchor the transect tape or rope at either end, especially on windy days. If you don't have any of these items, you could also use your own two feet by counting your paces. This means walk for a known distance and measure your footsteps. For example, if you have a room that you know is 12 feet long and it takes you seven steps to get across, your pace is seven steps per 12 feet. Next time you go into the field, place a rock or other objects such as a water bottle to mark your starting point. Take seven steps and then mark your ending point using another rock or object. You've now made a 12 foot transect. Whatever method you use, it's important to record the type of method and tools used on your data sheet. Lay the transect tape or your other physical markers so that they trace the title height for the entire length of the transect. You can use markings along the shoreline, such as algae or dark markings from the water on rocks or bulkhead to estimate the tidal height. Depending on the slope of the shoreline, you may have a portion of your transect area in the water. On steep slopes, it may be difficult to search in the water since the drop-off will be greater. Once your transect is laid out, designate one person to be the recorder and at least one person to be the observer for each transect. It's important to record the number of observers, transect length, or how long your transect is, what type of surface you are surveying, for example, riprap or wood pilings, and the start and end time of your survey so that we know how much time the area was searched. Since the intensity of a search can affect the number of oysters found, we can standardize the data for effort across different sites or visits. 
sketch a hand-drawn map of the site or use a pre-printed map and a marker to sketch the location of your transect. If a GPS unit is available, record the coordinates of the start and end points. You can also use your phone and a GPS app. Now that you're ready, you can start to search for oysters. When searching for oysters, look within one meter on either side of the transect tape. Don't disturb the rocks or substrate by overturning it. But if you are surveying on top of riprap, don't forget to look in the crevices between rocks. For each oyster found, record whether it is alive or dead and take a photo using a quarter for scale. You can tell an oyster is dead because when you tap lightly on top of the shell, you'll hear a hollow sound. If the shell is visibly gaping open, if there is softness or movement in the shell, or if bubbles are discharged when the shell is slightly pressed, this means the oyster is dead. To double check that an oyster is dead, try to gently pry them open with your fingernail. A dead oyster will generally pry open very easily. Often dead oysters are filled with mud and therefore can be mistaken for being alive. If you are using calipers, be sure to record the height of the oysters after marking them as alive or dead on your data sheet. When using calipers to measure the oyster, first identify the umbo, or the pointed end, and the bill, or the rounded end, of the oyster shell. Measure the shell height by placing the top part of the external jaws on one end of the oyster, either at the umbo or the bill, and sliding the jaws closed at the other end of the oyster so that the jaws tighten around the oyster shell. Look closely and notice where the zero is on the sliding part of the caliper. The main scale on a caliper typically tells you the whole number plus the first decimal. Read this as you would a ruler referring to a zero mark on the sliding scale. In the video, you can see that it lands at 3.6 centimeters. At Billion Oyster Project, we like to measure our oysters in millimeters. So we have to convert our centimeters into millimeters. We can do that easily by shifting the decimal place one over to the right. So one centimeter equals 10 millimeters. For example, continuing with our previously measured oyster, when you move the decimal and 3.6 centimeters over to the right, we get 36 millimeters. Once you converted your measurement into millimeters, record the number on your data sheet. Add any other comments you want to share in the data sheet. Do this for the length of your transect. Once the survey is complete, please examine the data sheet to be sure you included all the necessary information and take a photo in case it gets lost or blown away. Congratulations, you just completed a wild oyster survey. So a couple of other things to consider before we go out and do our wild oyster surveys is that it'll take between one and two hours, depending on how closely you wanna look at things and how big your survey is. So we tell people to budget about two hours at the site and you should try to get there at low tide. And so be there about an hour before the lowest of low tide and then be there about an hour afterwards and that'll get you through the whole survey. You need teams of at least two people to do the survey, but the more you have, the more fun it'll be. Um, and you can, you can split up your tasks by having one person be the recorder and one person be the observer in the field if you only have two people. But it's good to have one person that's in charge of recording to make sure that the data gets recorded consistently. You can always switch when you go between transects though. The number of transects that you do at each site will depend on how much time you have available and how big the transects are. It's important if you're somewhere that's muddy or rocky that you go slowly, and so you might do fewer transects at a muddy or rocky site, and that's okay. Make sure that you let us know how much time you spend at each site, though, so that we can standardize the amount of time and standardize for effort. And if oysters are plentiful at a site, you can also downsize your transect so that you can have a much more thorough examination. We showed you how to do a land-based survey, but you can also do this from a canoe or kayak, and it'll be very similar. Um, what you'll do is get in your boat and focus on the shoreline and look for hard structures like seawall, rocks, or even the bottom, depending on visibility. And that's where you'd expect to find oysters. You should try to get within about an arm's length to try and see and photograph the oysters. And if you're an arm's length, you can also easily measure them for your data sheet as well. 
instead of laying out a transect tape, you're going to have to estimate the distance of your transect when you're in a boat. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. One way is to select two landmarks on the shoreline. And in this example, we chose this rock here and this red piece of seaweed up here. And it's between these two points where you'll go look for oysters. And what you can do is photograph the section of shoreline with your boat in the photo. And if you know how long your boat is, say we know the whole boat is eight feet long, this distance here and this distance here is about the length of the boat, so we can say that it's about four feet. Another way that you can measure the distance or estimate the distance of your transect is to go and take a GPS point down here, take a GPS point down here, and then actually measure the distance of the transect later on when you get home. It's better to do both of those if possible, um, but if you can only do one, that's also fine. It's better to get the data. Another thing to keep in mind is that you don't want to double count the oysters. And so if you're in a boat with someone, what you can do is split up and say, we're going to do this half and then the other person can do this half, but try to avoid double counting. So we've learned how to conduct a wild oyster survey. Let's talk a little bit more about the data sheets. It's really important to fill the data sheets out correctly. So when you get to the site, you should fill out the site name and you should give us the full name of the site, not just an abbreviation. We also need to know the date of the survey. You should tell us who's observing and looking for wild oysters and tell us who is recording on this data sheet. You should have one data sheet per transect. So if you plan to do five transects, bring five data sheets with you. You'll tell us whether the survey is on land or if you're near a canoe or a kayak. You'll look up the tide time and the height, and you can do that by Googling it. You can go to NOAA. And remember, you want to go out at low tide. You should tell us how long the transect is and whether it's in meters or feet. You should tell us about the site. Is it rocky shoreline? Is it a sandy beach? Are you in a boat and you're looking at metal bulkheads? We also need to know the time that you start and end your survey. Again, this is important so that we can standardize for the amount of effort that goes into that. We also need to know the GPS coordinates at the start and end of your survey. This is important in, so that we can figure out how long the survey is, but also so that we can go back in case we find something cool and we wanna go check it out. As you walk along your transect, you're going to mark whether you find a live or dead oyster. If you want to measure them, you can put the shell height and then any other notes that you might have. Once you've filled this out, it's really important to make sure that you submit it to us by scanning this QR code and it'll take you to a Google form. And in that form, you'll add your email address and then you'll answer all these questions, which are just gonna be the information from the top of your data sheet or what we call the metadata. So again, the site name, the date, and eventually it's gonna ask you to upload photos of the front and back of your data sheet. Please make sure that you get the whole picture of the whole data sheet. So we're seeing the whole thing. It's not cut off at the top or showing only part of the data. We want to see the whole data sheet. We also want to see the back of the data sheet, just in case you wrote something on the back. Please make sure it's legible, that it's written in clear handwriting, and the photo itself is not blurry. Um, a couple of common mistakes to please avoid when you're sending in your data sheets to us. Uh, making sure that the data sheets aren't blurry, making sure that you submit the full page, um, including all of the people, all of the folks that are your recorders and observers, making sure that they're all listed. You want to make sure that you count and include the dead oysters. You also want to make sure that you use, again, one data, one transect per data sheet. So please avoid these mistakes here. So some really basic field safety, and we'll talk more about this when we go out into the field together, um, but wear appropriate clothing, look at the weather that day. If it's raining, wear rain gear. If it's going to be hot and sunny, wear a sun shirt and a hat. Make sure you have sunscreen and a water bottle with you. You also want appropriate footwear. You should have closed-toed shoes that can get wet or muddy. Um, and especially if you're going to be out on slippery rocks, you want something with good treads and ankle support. If you are going to be out on rocks, be very, very careful. 
generally don't go out in heavy rain and definitely don't go out alone. You should always bring a friend or family member with you. Bring a charged cell phone. One, we want you to take lots of pictures and tag us on social media, but you also need it in case there's an emergency. Bring a small first aid kit with you just in case you need it, but know where the closest hospital is in case of a larger emergency. You should only go places where you know you have permission and you've checked either with the landowner or with uh, the appropriate parks personnel. And if you're getting into the water or going somewhere where you're near the water and it's appropriate, you should wear a life jacket or a personal flotation device. All right, we've gotten through our video training portion. Let's talk a little bit more about the logistics for part two or your field monitoring. So you received an email with this video in it. It has instructions and all the information you need for the field. Now that you've watched this video, please take a short survey to make sure you're prepared for your field day. You can access it by going to your inbox and clicking the link in that instructional email, or you can go to this QR code right here on the right hand side. Also, please make sure that you sign the waiver and you're going to submit it through the survey as well. That waiver is really important. And if you don't submit it, I'm going to have a paper version for you on the day up. But please make sure you do this ahead of time. On the day of the event, please arrive 15 minutes before the event is slated to start so that we can get you signed in. Dress appropriately, rain or shine, we're going out. Unless there's a 70% chance of rain or more, in which case I will email you by 3 p.m. the day before to cancel. And please bring water, preferably in a reusable bottle, but any other supplies, including data sheets, pencils, et cetera, will be provided to you. When you get to your training site, which again, there's more information in that informational email, you'll look for one of these three people, Jen Zhu, our Marine Habitat Resource Specialist, Anna Weiss, myself, the Community Science Program Manager, or Cody Herman, our Community Science Technician. We'll get you signed in and ready to go. All right, so we've gotten through part one, we'll move into part two next, and then you'll be ready to go out and search for wild oysters. Thank you so much for watching this training video. If you have any questions before the training day in the field, please don't hesitate to reach out to wildoyster at billionoysterproject.org. Thank you for your attention. Please don't forget to fill out the survey and have a fantastic day. Bye everyone.